Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friday live stream. There is a ton of stuff to go over, so we just got to jump right in so we can dive through all these things. So first of all, of course, like the thumbnail and title suggests, we're going to take a look at the ROI, Bitcoin ROI after having. And in the last 48, 72 hours or so, I did a video where I talked about, hey, it's a green day today, time to take some profits or time to cash out or time to, uh, you know, take something off the table. And when I did that video, of course, I got a lot of people going, what are you, uh, an idiot? You shouldn't be taking any profits right now. We're going to go up, up to the moon. And of course, we talk about this. It's not just about like going to the moon or whatnot. And of course, on the video, we, we take a look at the different indicators and no, it wasn't a, a great time to take profits, but we must always be aware that at some point, we're going to have to take things off the table. And somebody put sent this to me, they go, Rob, don't forget about the uh, Bitcoin ROI after having. I go, that's pretty interesting. I had to take a look at that. And of course, the best place to find this is uh, Ben's website as I totally steal everything from him. But uh, this one, this is us right now. This is cycle four return on investment. And we can see that, of course, we just had our Bitcoin halving about a month ago, right? April 20th, coming up on uh, what May 17th or so today. So we can see that the ROI I mean, <laughs> took a little bit of a dip, but here we are. Not too bad. Remember, uh, we're way ahead of schedule, in my personal opinion, as, as opposed to like our previous havocs. But when we take a look at this as far as like the, and put things into context, let's take a look at the last cycle. Look at that. Isn't that, a, isn't that a crazy just to think about? I mean, it's just unbelievable. Hold on real quick. How do I? There we go. Jonathan, yet again, calling me every single time. All right. Sorry about that. So we take a look here, and we're going into cycle three. And look at this, this ROI. And what this we're taking a look at is if the ROI value is two, then Bitcoin has made 100% move from the halving price, right? That's just where we're at. And right now, for the halving cycle four, we're at one point, right now we're at 1.01. But look at this, in the last cycle, not too bad, 7.38. And look how much time it took from the halving, which I want to say was around May 11th, May 12th of 2020, all the way to the top. And this is taking a look at, if we're taking a look at, uh, let's see, April. Let's take a look at November. I like how Ben did this. You can either go April or November, because it was kind of like a double top. I think Bitcoin maxed out around 63,000 and 67,000. We come over here, 7.86. So again, we got a long way to go, but look at this. This is what's interesting. Take a look at the, 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 the cycle before that. And we can see, this is where it kind of gets a little bit jumbled. Let me take out cycle three. Take a look at cycle two. Look at this one, this is a beauty. This one we had, it went from 2016. Look at that, July 11, 2016, to the ROI. To, geez, at least 30.13. So there is a little bit of diminishing returns, but again, it was a long way to go after the halving to the next one. Let me put back cycle three and now cycle one. So here we go. Cycle one was a long time ago. We're talking about 2012, the very first halving. And then up it goes, if we can zoom in real quick, 85.44. So yes, there are diminishing returns, but again, the time frame, the time frame where we're at, this is a very early to where, we're, to where we are potentially going. And then if we extrapolate that, I just want to take a look at just, you know, where we could go. There's another one called the Bitcoin market cycle bottom ROI. So with this one, again, we take a look at uh, cycle five, which was one we're at right now from the, from the bottom. I want to say that was, yeah, November, 2022, I think Bitcoin was around 17,000, correct me in the comment section. And from that bottom, 17,000 to rule roughly was it? Yeah, March 12th, when we hit around 73 or something like that, 4.5, pretty good. But that's from the actual market cycle bottom. But look at this one. If we take the last cycle before, look at these monstrous numbers, 20. Market cycle three, 95. Market cycle two, oof, disgusting, 417th. <laughs> I didn't want to show you this one. 
Uh, 525. So again, you, we can see that there is diminishing returns from the cycle bottom as well as the ROI, and we can't really put that into perspective yet, from the having to the top to the top. So maybe we're over here, but again, only time will tell as we move forward. So that takes care of the Bitcoin part, which I can, you know, people are pretty keen on that, but what about altcoins? Is this what they call altcoin season right now? Well, there's a pretty good uh, thing on, on the website, altcoin season index. And we can see right here, I like how, how this one was put out. The amount of the top 50 altcoins that have a 90 day return on investment greater than Bitcoin. And this is just going back 90 days. It's updated every single day. And we can see, if you wanna say this is the altcoin season, how it's defined on the site is you have to be 75% of the altcoins have to be ahead of Bitcoin, meaning they have to outperform Bitcoin, not just a couple of days, not just a couple of weeks, but 90 days moving forward. And we can see that right now as it pertains, Bitcoin ROI, 29% over the last 90 days. Pretty good. But look at the ones that have crushed it. And we talked about this on NFA Live yesterday. The first two that have absolutely destroyed in the last 90 days are meme coins, Pepe and Dogwood Fat. I know it pisses people off at some point, unless they invest into it, then all of a sudden they're fine with the meme coins. But then the next part, Arweave, which is essentially a D-pin play for uh, blockchain saving or uh, file, file saving uh, within the blockchain. Fetch AI, AI play, Toncoin, which is through Telegram. Then look at this, the next one, a meme coin. So out of the top five, three of those are meme coins. And then near protocol, look at that, 142%. Phantom, all right. Dogecoin, again, meme coin, the first one. Render, AI play, Bitcoin Cash, <laughs> crazy. BNB and everybody's favorite, well, I shouldn't say everybody's favorite, but Solana, as good as it's been, over 90 days, it's only been 50, up 54%, but you've still outperformed Bitcoin. But the thing I will say about this, as far as like altcoins and where we're at, when we're in altcoin season, meaning that over 90 days, they've outperformed Bitcoin, what does that tell you? It tells you that if you're on that side and you're like, hey, it's altcoin season, because over 90 days, they've outperformed Bitcoin, it's too late. You kind of miss your opportunity, in my personal opinion. I mean, I could be wrong here, but I don't want to be on the sidelines all the time. Now, my portfolio is 75% Bitcoin, but I'm not going to stand around and just say, well, maybe I could be wrong. So far, it's been okay for me since 2022 dollar cost averaging, but you never can tell. And you never can tell when things are going to really pop off. And you really never can tell what's going to happen in, with altcoins because as good as things are, I want to direct your attention to one, one particular altcoin in this outing that we have, Chainlink. You notice one thing about Chainlink, it's down 18% over the last 90 days. It's a negative ROI, 90 days negative. Why is that? Was there a hack? Did somebody come in and say, hey, we're gonna change the whole, the whole protocol? We're gonna make things totally different or we've been found out that we're actually a total scam? No, nothing's really. It hasn't really happened at all. But today, there was a big pump, and we're like, well, wonder what happened. This is what happened. And this is why, like, you can never really understand, like, really what's going on behind the scenes with a lot of these projects. And people will say, well, you know, I believe in this, I believe in that. But really what it comes down to is, is you got to like what you see, and you got to make sure that you're up on it, on all the news and what's happening. Because look at this one, Chainlink completes a pilot to accelerate fund tokenization with JP Morgan, Templeton, BNY Mellon participating. Let me say that again. Real world assets, fund tokenization. JP Morgan, the largest bank, largest bank in the United States. I think it's the largest bank in the world. Templeton, BNY Mellon, one of the oldest banks in the United States. I'm not sure it's the world. They're participating in link gains 7%. Now I think it's over 10%. Here's what happened. The DTCC, Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, world's largest security settlement system, completed a pilot project with Chainlink and multiple U.S. financial institutions. 
help, the aim is to help accelerate the tokenization of funds, like we're always talking about, real world assets, tokenization. The purpose of the project called SmartNav was to establish a standardized process to bring and disseminate net asset value data of funds across virtually any private or public blockchains using Chainlink. So again, when we come back here and we're like, oh, well, it's not all coin season yet. I think, I think if you get there, it's too late. Now's the time to actually do some things. But that's just how I see things. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then also, um, I dollar cost average. I don't know what you do. I can't give you financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. Just some guy in front of a really nice green screen. So there was this part that I, I found interesting, uh, the historical best day to DCA. And it's like everything that you could ever want, all the different assets that are out there. And how he breaks it down is it's using the default seven day uh, simple moving average, a value of one on Sunday would indicate that the price on Sunday is on average 1% higher than the average price of the past seven days. Therefore, the day that has the lowest value in the chart is the best day of the week, the DCA. So we're taking a look at percentages. And it's saying that Bitcoin, average extension 1.3. So the, the historical best day to DCA is right there. And then also there, here's one on uh, Ethereum. And we can see here, average extension, let me see, make sure. Okay, a value of one on Sunday would indicate the price on Sunday is on average 1% higher than the average of the, price, the seven days. So on Sunday, it's not a good day. So you want to pick the low days, obviously. So Ethereum could be Friday. And there's a whole host of things. I can't show them all to you, but if you want to find that out, there's a link in the description. You can check out Ben's site. So I just thought it was interesting how that was all pulled together. So I'm feeling pretty good about it, but I can't give you everything that's great news. I got to kind of rein everything back and give you some bad news. So here you go. Uh, defaults. This is from the uh, Kobishi letter. And apparently in the macro environment, maybe you're feeling this as well, nearly nine, there's a huge amount of credit card debt. And now it's, as I was under the impression, I thought it was right under a trillion. Now it's 1.12 trillion. Nearly about, we'll say 10%, nearly 10%, okay, nearly 9% of the 1.12 trillion in credit card debt has transitioned to delinquency, meaning people are not paying their credit cards. That's very bad because it's not like they have super low interest rates. This was a status that was reported in Q1 of 2024 and it's coming out recently. That's a hundred billion of credit card debt. All, also 8%, I didn't know even know this, 8% of the 1.62 trillion of auto loans transitioned to delinquency. So again, you got people not paying their credit cards and not paying their cars. What happens next? They go into default. If, they, if that happens, people get their cars picked up which is a really bad idea for everybody involved, especially because no one's making money, people can't get to work. It's just a thing that I, I see that uh, could really snowball into something bad. Now, we'll see how it all works out, but uh, this is why money printing and probably rate cuts are on the horizon, but I could be wrong. So uh, this is not positive, but I had to bring it to your attention because if I give everybody like the moon boy stuff, then people go crazy. So there's that part also. Here's another thing. Uh, there was a bill that was shot down. Actually, it was repealed. And it went through House of Representatives here in the United States. We have two chambers, House of Representatives, then it goes to the Senate, then it goes to the, to the President of the United States to, to either sign or veto. And the bill, SAB 121, which discourages banks from providing custodial services for digital assets. And the reason why it was bad, it required them to keep those assets on balance. On balance versus off balance. There's a little refresher, like I said in, my, in the X post. When you have something off balance, it means that assets are not reflected in the company's financial statements and are not used by the company to impact the company's ratios or leverage, meaning they can't use it. That was the problem with FTX and Celsius and Voyager and BlockFi is they held them on balance. And that's what this law was repealed by the House of Representatives and by the Senate. Now the question is, will it actually be vetoed? Because there was a letter that was put out by the President of the United States saying, I will veto this bill if it gets through the Senate. So we'll see. And then Eleanor Charrett, fantastic reporter here. She says that 
there's a thing called a pocket veto. I've never heard of this in my life. But this is actually what could happen. I find this fascinating that they could do this stuff. Pocket veto, which I've seen some people mention, is what happens next to SAB 120, 121. From the time a bill reaches his desk, meaning he has to go through House of Representatives, Senate, then do his desk, the President has 10 days, excluding Sundays, to either sign or veto it. If he does nothing and Congress is in session, the bill will pass into law without his signature. But if he does nothing when Congress is not in session, something called a pocket veto can occur because Congress is not in session to receive the sign of veto. Bill. This means the president can basically give his stamp of disapproval and pin the bill resolution on not becoming law, and he can pin it on Congress and say, ah, they screwed up. So what does that mean? Well, Congress will be on break starting May 27th to June 3rd, which could fall during that 10-day window. But even though Congress is scheduled to be in re recess, they can still be in something called a pro forma session, which will allow the House to receive Biden's either signed or veto bill and bring the so-called pocket veto. So don't be surprised if this gets shot down. President Biden already said he was going to shoot it down and maybe he could do the pocket veto as Eleanor comes out here. So that's not great. That's actually a loss for us. It'd be a win for Elizabeth Warren, the ultimate crypto Karen, but whatever. So there we are, democracy in action. And then lastly, as far as the negative news, uh, which I don't think is that bad. Bitcoin mining costs drops to 45K as inefficient miners exit. And JP Morgan, who was just revealed to have participated in the uh, Bitcoin ETF, the bank sees limited upside for the Bitcoin price in the near term due to a number of headwinds. I'm gonna skip all this because it's kind of boring. This is what their headwinds are. They said, look, uh, there's two headwinds, which is pretty weak what they said. Lack of positive catalysts and disappearing retail impulse, weak sauce. So the thing is with this, as far as positive catalysts, we actually laid these out in a video we did three or four days ago. It's called the four catalysts. It really comes down to the M2 money supply, print go burr. It comes down to rate cuts, which at some point is gonna happen, which we only really talk about that. We talk about the presidency, which I don't really care who wins as long as we get out of the way because the market doesn't like volatility. They don't like indecision. So they just want to get it. And then after that, it'll probably do pretty well. Real reallocation of funds. And then another one called 13F. And we'll get to that in a second. So there's a link in the description. You can check that video out, but it's basic stuff. I mean, JP Morgan can say it's negative. I don't really find it negative. Okay. So that's the negative part. Let's close this out on a high note. Bitcoin traders are targeting 74K next week as the spot ETFs log four days of inflows. If you don't know, and the whole article is great, but I'm not gonna read it. Pretty much what they say is because there's so much inflows, they, the institutional mindset has shifted, the sentiment has shifted, and we're gonna see 74,000, which would be an all-time high coming up next week. And uh, well, they are right on that point. We've had four days of inflows. This is from heyapollo.com. If you're not looking at the screen, I can just show you, just tell you that uh, there are four positive days of Bitcoin ETF flows. We're not at the all-time high for total net flows at 217.6. I think we were beaten out over here around 220, yeah, 220.3 on April 10th, but we're pretty darn close. And that means we have gone north of what happened on May 1st when we had almost negative 10,000, uh, which was pretty bad. But of course, if we have institutions coming in, that means more money's coming in, everybody's happy, so that's great. On top of that, there was another, another chart for Bitcoin days and profits because because we've been hovering around the all-time highs. Yeah, we're a little bit low, I, I gotcha. But if we take a look here, April 24th, oh, it doesn't go through. We're still pretty good as far as days and profit as opposed to a lot of the altcoins that are out there. So I like to see that. And then also Eric Balchuna says it perfectly. And Eric, senior analyst at Bloomberg, he says, look, you guys don't understand just how well the ETFs actually did. I bit. Bitcoin ETF provider, ended up with 414 holders in the first 13F season. The 13F, of course, when they actually have to file, it, file with the SEC, these institutions and say, yeah, we hold it. And that's what's happening. 414 holders in the first 13F season, which is mind boggling. It blows away any record that's been out there. So there's a lot of big players, JP Morgan, one of them, 
who said, we got to get in on this. And they did it. And now they have to file. And now it's public. And now we're like, hey, and it's just been coming out. And we'll get to all those in a second. Even having 20 holders as a newborn is a BFD. It's a big effing deal. Highly rare. Here's a look at how the Bitcoin ETFs compared to other ETFs launched in January. And you can see it's almost laughable. I mean, look, people have poo-pooed Bitcoin forever. They've talked about ETFs. They've talked about the nonsense that is digital assets. And now here we are. It's one of the best performing ETFs of all time. So I think that's pretty good. Also, a bit why CIO says Bitcoin ETFs are a huge success and 13 f bonds make them incredibly bullish like we just talked about. And to, just to partner off of that, I just saw this today. This was yesterday. Morgan Stanley discloses the U.S. spot Bitcoin ETF holdings worth over a quarter of a billion dollars in filings. Not bad. So because of that, I had to add them to my list of the Bitcoin ETF reveal. And as a, as a reminder, there's a link in the description. And this is all the, the high value, interesting institutions that have gotten into this ETF. Booth Bay, 150 million. Millennium Management discloses 2 billion. Pine Ridge Advisors, 205 million. State of Wisconsin Investment Board, not bad, 100 million. Switzerland Bank, Bank of Montreal, Bracebridge with 262 million, JP Morgan, Rothschild, millions. Ah, Rubric Capital, 60 million and Wells Fargo as well. And then of course now we have Morgan Stanley with 270 million in filing. So again, I know I sound pretty bullish today, but there's a good reason for that. Things are moving in the right direction. I couldn't be happier. Does that mean that we're gonna go straight up? Yeah, probably not. But I tell you, I tell you, I still think we're in the right place at the right time and we're early. Don't let anybody tell you differently. That's it for today. Oof. So look, I know that was a bit long, 22 minutes. That's it for today. So if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive.